Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about concentration and focus, both when you're learning how to drive and when you're driving after you get your license and are working to be a smarter driver, stay crash free and be defensive. Stick around, we'll be right back with that information. Hi there Smart Drivers, welcome back. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about concentration and focus. And I just realized I moved things around a little bit here in the studio and I need to sit back a little farther from the camera. I can't come right up on the camera, otherwise I'm out of the frame. So yes, uh, Katie's here, uh, Presto Car is here, Drew's here, uh, Tanya is here, Bricks for Wheels is Corey. Corey is the moderator and I wanna thank everybody for showing up and your comments and whatnot and uh, let us know where you're tuning in from in North America, in the world, and what class of license you may or may not be going for. And Carrie is here from Minnesota. And excellent, okay, so concentration and focus is what we're talking about today. I did another poll on the community tab this week and got surprisingly the same results that I got the last time <laughs> that I had the poll. So hopefully some of that information is going to help you out. Uh, Office is here, passed G2 on Friday. Congratulations, that is awesome there in uh, Ontario. Where did you pass your G2 in Ontario? Cody is here. Uh, Presto is from Fort Worth, Texas. Welcome from Fort Worth, Texas, Exton. Uh, Winston is here from Toronto and B Brooks is here from Texas. Hello there in Texas. I always love going to Texas because I, you know, you just cannot get huevos rancheros here in Ontario the way you can down there. <laughs> GK from uh, Lethbridge. Uh, Roth Tank, I passed my drive test uh, a month ago and I've been driving for a while now, but just wanted to thank you for your help. And you are most welcome. We're really happy to hear that we could help you out. Uh, Donna, Fife in Scotland. Oh, I love Scotland. I did a bicycle tour there some years ago and I wanna go back to Scotland. So hello for in there in Scotland. Nan is from Jersey. Hallface is here from Toronto. Hello everybody. Thanks for tuning in. I look forward to your questions and helping you out here. And just gonna get transitioned over here. We'll get through the PowerPoint presentation and then we'll be back to answer your questions. And we're gonna talk about learning today. We're gonna talk about focus and concentration give you some skills and strategies to stay focused while you're on the roadway and help you out with all of that. So bear with me, just get through this and then we'll come back, questions and answers. So focus and concentration, as I said, both when you're learning how to drive and after you get your license so that you remain crash free, uh, that your ride becomes you know, somewhat boring because it should be boring if you're doing it right and driving defensively. Uh, we have a picture here, and this is, I believe, the Great Ocean Road in Australia. And if you get a chance to go to Australia, do drive the Great Ocean Road uh, along the south coast of Australia there. It is an absolutely magic ride uh, through there, and a lot of uh, motorcycles go through there as well, and uh, just fantastic country. All right, so for those of you who may be new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I am a licensed driving instructor teaching cars, trucks, buses, motorcycles, and air brakes, and we can help you uh, get a license, start a career as a CDL driver, and be a smarter driver. I was a truck driver through the 1990s. Uh, in uh, 2002 to 2006, while I was in Australia, I drove for Greyhound and was a coach captain driving highway coaches. Uh, 1998, I became a licensed commercial driving instructor. I've also worked uh, doing driver rehabilitation specialists, working with people with hand controls and debilitating injuries to return to driving. And in 2006, I graduated from the University of Melbourne with a doctorate in legal history, which is study of policing courts and prisons, as you may or may not know. And my expertise, oddly enough, is in policing as it relates to traffic. And if you passed a road test of late, uh, Corey will put the link up for you. Head over to the Smart Drive Test website and sign up for that. Also, while you're over there, check out all of the great courses. We've got some great specials on. Uh, and I'll mention those a little more in more detail later on. But there is a course package Pass your road test first time, defensive driving in the winter driving course for $60.97. Uh, and we throw in the winter driving uh, as a bonus to that package. So check that out as well with winter coming up. So this week's uh, video was driving debacles. It was uh, analyzing a couple of uh, video clips that I had and this will talk, this will segue or 
lead into what I'm talking today about focus and concentration on the roadway. And you can see here in the image, this flat deck trailer, the driver actually was parked in a driveway and the trailer was still hanging out on the roadway. And as I was driving by, if you saw the video, I went, what the freak and heck is that guy doing? Because <laughs> it's kind of an overcast day. It's a black trailer. It's low. It's not that big and it's still hanging on the roadway. And it would have been very easy for somebody to drive into that parked vehicle. So driving debacles for sure. And there was another clip of another tra RV trailer. Same thing. Tried to pull off the road and didn't get off the road. Didn't know where his or her vehicle was in space and place. So, you know, we do all have those what the heck moments and what the freaking hell is that person doing moments while we're driving. So <laughs> that's what we're going to talk about today so that you don't get completely distracted by that. Because as you can see by both these case uh, polls that I put up, this was a few months ago, this one here, 839 votes. And again, 56% of drivers said that it's the actions of other road users that distract them. It's not... Uh, passengers in their conversation it's not electronic devices and telematics within the vehicle uh, for those of you who may or may not know telematics in the vehicle it's the newer vehicles with the big screen in the middle that controls your radio and controls navigation and all of the that information that the vehicle now provides for drivers they don't find all of that distracting what they find distracting is the actions of other road users and i somewhat found this surprising so again, this week I did another poll and 300, almost 370 people respond to the poll. Uh, electronic devices came in at 20%. Again, actions of other users, almost exactly the same as it was before, 56%. This, this time it came in at 54%. Uh, telematics, electronics is part of the vehicle, hardly at all distracting. I find it incredibly distracting when I get into these vehicles. Uh, passengers in the conversa conversations only 23%. So we can see that the actions of other road users is something that drivers find really distracting. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit more here today. And so the actions of other drivers are go they're going to make mistakes. Today uh, I was driving downtown Vernon, uh, out of province license plate, one of our friends from Alberta and they were kind of doing something kind of weird they weren't driving the speed limit they weren't proceeding through the intersection and, and i <laughs> i said what the heck are they doing the next thing you know the driver's pulling a u-turn right in the intersection so if you got that what the heck moment give the other vehicle some space uh do not engage in revenge and emotions and response and those types of things you know don't go on a diatribe you want to try and move as a smart driver, as a learning driver, you want to move from going when somebody else does something unpredictable, you want to go from what the freaking heck is that person doing? Oh my God, where did you get your license out of a Cracker Jack box to, oh, that happened and let them drive off and have their crash somewhere else. That's where, that's the transition that you want to make to being a smarter driver and being a safer driver. Because when you have that diatribe, you are being distracted by the other driver and you are not focusing on what you are doing. So as all of us are aware, anybody who lives in North America or any other part of the world right now, governments are on these huge campaigns to reduce distracted driving within the vehicle. And distracted driving, as most of them think, is our phones is telematics within the vehicle any activity you're shaving you're putting on makeup you're eating <laughs> you're talking to other people on the phone those types of things all of this is what they think is distracting other drivers when most drivers are actually saying what's distracting them in fact is the actions of other drivers on the roadway who they think couldn't drive who they wouldn't let drive their wheelbarrow <laughs> let alone drive a car on a public highway so this is what's distracting people so electronics and telematics, as I said, I find newer vehicles uh, distracting and I've gone down to Honda and here in a couple of weeks, we're gonna go down and shoot some videos on the Honda Sensing Suite and uh, which is uh, adaptive cruise control, lane assist, keeping the vehicle in the lane and those types of things. So this is some of the things that uh, electronics and telematics, which is what the public education program is t telling drivers, is that it's mobile phones, telematics, noise, fatigue, and emotional distress. And I talked about that in the video a couple of weeks ago, uh, driving in the rain and how to drive in the rain, that the sound, the noise from rain on the vehicle and driving on the highway with the windshield wipers going and whatnot can, can contribute to increased amounts of fatigue while you're driving. So be careful while you're doing that. 
The other thing with other drivers, when you're being distracted by other drivers' actions and you're saying to yourself, well, I wouldn't let that person drive my wheelbarrow, uh, is that that person may be impaired. I mean, marijuana is now legal in, many, in, in a number of states in the U.S. It's legal here in British Columbia and other provinces in Canada. So these people may be impaired. And if, you know, and organizations against drinking and driving may think that drinking and driving has reduced, but unfortunately it hasn't. It's still something that happens in our society and many drivers are drinking and driving. So know that as well. And what is happening in the driving landscape? Are people distracted by things that are going on in the driving landscape? For example, there's a detour or there's construction or those types of things. So again, we come back to the laws, traffic laws will no more prevent crashes than criminal law will prevent crime. It, they are going to happen. So you need to decide when you're out on the roadway, you can be right because I've got the right of way or you can be dead right. Because if you insist that you got the right of way, unfortunately, you may end up in a crash or risk being in a crash and being injured, maimed or killed in a car crash, you and your loved ones and other people, other road users using the roadway. So know that. Passengers are going to contribute to distraction. At least this is what traffic authorities believe. This is what experts believe because just about every GLP program, every GDL program, graduated licensing program or graduated driver's licensing program limits the number of passengers that you can have in the vehicle when you're in the novice phase of that program. So you can only have one other person in the vehicle that's not a direct relative. So most GDL, GPL programs will allow uh, siblings, mom, dad, and grandparents in the vehicle. So you can have more than one passenger, but for the most part, if it's just a friend, you can only have one pe person in the vehicle. If they're distracting you or you're executing a complicated maneuver, ask them to be quiet. So if you're doing a left-hand turn at a complicated intersection, simply ask your passengers to be quiet, do your maneuver, and then carry on with your life. Top three reasons. I come back to the top three reasons for crashes. Speeding, failing to yield, following too close. I would say and argue that yes, speeding contributes to fatalities because the faster the vehicle goes, there's more energy in the vehicle and if it crashes, you're more susceptible to being maimed and killed in a car crash. However, failing to yield, thinking that you have the right of way and you're gonna go because you're distracted by what the other driver's doing because that person is a freaking moron and I got the right of way and I'm gonna go instead of taking your foot off the throttle, managing space well, and the next thing you know, you're into a crash. Or you're simply too close because you failed to yield, you were determined that you had the right of way, and therefore you were distracted by the other driver on the roadway. Speed contributes to maiming and fatalities, as I said. So know that these are the three top crashes. And simply by having the notion that you can let them take your foot off the throttle, they can carry on with their day and have their crash somewhere else, and you manage space well around your vehicle, you can mitigate these uh, reasons for traffic crashes. You can significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash. So why do we get so emotional when we're in a car? One of the reasons that we're so emotional when we're in cars is because we're comfortable in our personal space. Every one of us is very comfortable in our car. We see our car as a personal living space. Uh, we often uh, personalize our vehicle with stickers on the outside, bumper stickers, things inside the car, fuzzy dice on the windows, uh, you know, the very famous mud flaps with the woman with the large bosoms on the mud flaps and those types of things. We have a gun rack. Many people in Texas have gun racks in the back window of their truck, right? So we personalize our space within our vehicles. And because we're in this small metal box, emotions are exaggerated. So when somebody does something goofy, we get over the top in terms of the way that we react impulsively. Many people do react impulsively. This kind of Jekyll and Hyde. And Corey, I'll put the link up for you over uh, my biography, on my, my autobiography on my website. And on there is the Mr. Walker, Mr. Wheeler, which looks at the Jekyll and Hyde uh, character of these two people, Mr. Walker and Mr. Wheeler, and how they change. They're a very nice person when they're walking, but when they get in the vehicle and they're Mr. Wheeler, all of a sudden they become this maniacal crazy person, right? And this is what happens to people. So you become distracted by other people's mistakes. And know that other people's mistakes, as I say here at the bottom of the slide, other people's mistakes are not always intentional. They're not always known. 
right? The person cuts you off, for example, the person may not even have known you they cut you off. They went to work and had a happy day and you're miserable for the rest of the day because that one person cut you off. So know that it's not always intentional. The other thing that can help you to manage space and to give the right of way is to predict traffic patterns. And you do this by looking ahead, identifying intersections, identifying turning lanes and whatnot, looking for rubberneckers and things out of the ordinary. For example, today when I was coming through Vernon, the out of province license plate. So for those of you in the United States, out of state license plates, uh, vehicles that are loaded up with, uh, you know, camping gear and those types of things are going to indicate that something's wrong or the person may be lost or whatnot. Uh, here in North America, we are beginning to see roundabouts emerge on the driving landscape and a lot of people don't know how to deal with roundabouts. So be prepared to deal with other people's lack of information and lack of knowledge about driving, okay? Know the characteristics of vehicles and road users. So big trucks, for example, you don't want to sit in behind a big truck when you're coming off the light because they're not going to go as fast, especially if they're loaded. Uh, in the springtime and summertime, motorcycles, RV units, those types of things, all of these are going to be plying for road space and they're going to compete with you. So you need to know the characteristics of these different vehicles. Predictable traffic patterns. Road rules create predictable traffic patterns. When you execute an unpredictable uh, action on the roadway, for example, the person that did the U-turn at the intersection in downtown Vernon today, it exponentially increases your chances of being involved in a crash. So some of the strategies, as I, as I mentioned already, space management. Manage the space around your vehicle because if you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit something. Situational awareness. Be aware of what's going on in your environment. Look farther down the road. Uh, look at the traffic patterns that will allow you to predict the individual actions of road users. If somebody else becomes crazy, does something goofy, does something stupid that actually raises your eye or gets you upset, do not engage. Simply sit back, smile, take a breath and go, you can go and have your crash somewhere else. Have a nice day, right? Set your mind when you get in the vehicle. Know that it's not a matter of if it's going to happen because we all know it's going to happen. We've all had it happen to us. People have cut us off. People sped by us. People do all kinds of goofy things, do U-turns in downtown Vernon, okay? Know that it's going to happen. And if, when it does happen, instead of going, oh, shaking your fist and cursing and swearing and tell them that you're going to hunt them down and drive them off the road and beat them senseless, simply say, so, oh, that happened. Let's go and have a good day, okay? Unpredictable actions. Know that unpredictable actions are going to catch you off guard. The reason that they catch you off guard is because the reality doesn't meet up with your expectations. Your expectations is that everybody's going to drive correctly on the roadway and have predictable actions and obey the traffic laws. The reality is, is they're not. If you think they are, uh, probably maybe driving is not something you want to take up as a career. All right, so that's, we can answer questions and answers here. Good luck in your road test. And remember, pick the best answer not necessarily the right answer. As well, as I said, check out the courses over at smartdrivetest.com. Uh, I know the winter driving course is on special, the defensive driving, you can pick that up for $17. And the course package, uh, the smart, uh, smart driver package, pass your road test first time, defensive driving, and the winter driving course all on special. And we throw in the winter driving course as a bonus. And Corey will put those links up for you too. So we'll head over back over here and we will answer questions for people and Jonathan is here from New York. Hello, Jonathan. All right, now I'll get back into this. All right, Cody passed class seven road test and now a novice smart driver. Thank you, you are most welcome. Happy to hear that you passed that, got your learner's license and are going with that. That's brilliant. Uh, Jonathan, one thing I found in common that distracts is people using their smartphones, texting and exploring the internet and not paying attention. I've seen it happen all the time and not seeing traffic. Yeah, and that's that's interesting, Jonathan, that this is what's going on in the, in the real traffic environment, that people are in fact using their cell phones. They're on their cell phones, there's no doubt about it. Uh, for GPS, navigation, uh, whatever happens, but when people answer the poll, and this is another poll that I need to put up this week, is I need to ask people and say, are you using your phone when you're driving? You know, because I don't care if you are, it's an anonymous poll, so you can tell me whether you're using your phone or not. And, <laughs> you know, I hate to say it, but I think everybody is guilty of using their phone. 
when they're driving at some point, right? It's unless you put the thing in the trunk, it's pretty tough uh, not to use your phone for GPS or whatnot. So this is what happens. But it's interesting that the poll this week said that what distracts drivers, in fact, is other drivers action on the roadway and we all get bent out of shape i mean the video this week that i put up with the guy with the rv trailer first of all he's got something strapped to the back of the trailer he's got a tarp over it and the tarp is blocking the lights and then when the driver tried to move off the roadway the driver didn't get off all, all the way off the roadway so the driver didn't know where the vehicle was in space and place which annoyed me a little bit because i don't quite think i had my coffee quite that morning but you know it happens so uh, Cam, where am I from? I am in British Columbia, in the interior of British Columbia. All right, Jonathan, as a school bus driver, children on my bus can distract you. The key is to be patient and cancel out the noise. As I said to my other colleagues, we're at work, uh, we're getting tested out by them. Yes, and children can do that. Children can distract you. Uh, parents who have young children in the back of their vehicle, they can definitely <laughs> distract you uh, when they're driving, when you're driving. So know that as well, that children will distract you when you're driving. There's all kinds of distractions that we're uh, trying to mitigate while we're driving. Other people's actions on the roadway, children, passengers in the vehicle, children on the bus. Uh, I've had passengers when I was driving coach in Australia that were incredibly <laughs> distracting uh, because other passengers are complaining about them and I need somehow to deal with the issue and try and resolve the issue uh, so there's all of those things as well that are going on when you're driving. Uh, yes, there we go. Uh, okay, hall phase, especially when at a stoplight. Winston, on, next Friday is my G test in Ontario. God help me. No, you just need to practice and you're going to be fine. Uh, Winston, have you booked a practice driving test uh, this week that you can go out and do a practice driving test with a local driving instructor just to have your skills assessed or whatnot? or have you taken driving lessons? Because if you've done that as well, that'll also help you out. Uh, raffle tank, I've been driving a while, but one of my problems is right on reds, especially because I get pressured from the car behind me to go as soon as possible. Uh, any advice on getting over this? Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, you know, if they honk, just smile, <laughs> give them a wave in the mirror, and go on about your life. I know it's difficult when people honk at you because we react to sound first. And it, it shocks us, right? We're like, oh my God, what's going on? Somebody just honked. And we don't want to impede other people. There's a great deal of pressure by other drivers because driving is a social activity. And one of the things we get honked at is because we impede other people. And for the very reason that when we drive, Everybody's got the notion that if somebody's driving faster than you, they're a butthead. And if somebody's driving slower than you and holding you up, you're like, oh, you're a goofball, right? Have you ever noticed that about driving? It happens all the time. And people are gonna honk at you. If they think that you're holding them up, they're gonna honk at you. And unfortunately, that's a reality of driving. But you gotta take your time, breathe, go when you're comfortable. You are the captain of the ship. You are the captain of the ship. You are driving the car. There's nobody else. So you, let them honk. Let them go and have their crash somewhere else. Okay? Uh, Rush Girl. Dogs hanging out the window make me a basket case and distract me. <laughs> and that's an excellent point, Rush Girl. That is an excellent point. I see it a lot with people and their pets in their car and the pet is on their lap and it's running around inside. How can that not be distracting? <laughs> That's crazy. And I mean, if you've got a dog on your, how are you manipulating the steering wheel, right? And this is what I'm, this is what I'm saying about, we don't know as people in the vehicle, wh what the skill level of the person, the other driver is. We don't know what's going on in their vehicle, what's distracting, whether they're looking at their phone, whether they're eating, whether they're shaving, they're putting their makeup on, we don't know where the pet is in the vehicle running around the vehicle the cats in the back window and next thing you know it gets spooked or something and it's on the front ah! <laughs> what is going on right uh presto where'd you go 
Uh, my parents would always say to hold my thoughts when they were trying to conduct a complex maneuver. I didn't understand until I started driving about two months ago. Yes, and presto, I'm the same way even now. Even with all the experience that I have in terms of driving, uh, if I'm out shooting a video and I'm talking to the camera and I'm, I'm doing the lessons that I need to be doing, uh, I will not, I'll stop talking and I'll just put a jump cut in the video. I won't try and talk through a left-hand turn. I mean, unless of course I'm teaching left-hand turns, then I'll continue to talk. But for the most part, I'm scanning traffic. I'm looking at the intersection and making that maneuver without talking because there's simply too much going on. There's too much observation. There's too much listening to what's going on because sound is very important when you're driving. And personally, my professional opinion is we do not give enough emphasis on the importance of sound when driving. And this is especially important for CDL drivers, for bus and truck drivers. It is incredibly important to have sound, especially when you're doing slow speed maneuvers or you're maneuvering in and around in other places like small places in parking lots and yards and places like that. Because if you hit something, and I've seen people do this, I watched a driver one night, I was in at the uh, yard in Vancouver, and you come in the yard, you drove in the yard, and they had all these dollies here. And they're the dollies that allow you to hook two trailers up behind a truck. So it's a, basically a set of wheels with a fifth plate in it. What does the guy do? He comes in on the blind side, turns it too sharp, and drags over these things. Well, when you're in yards, and Jonathan and Jake will back me up on this, when you're in yards and when you're maneuvering around yards, you've always got the windows down so you can hear what's going on and know that we react to sound first. So when you hit something or somebody yells, you automatically react to that. So I need, I need to emphasize to you the importance of sound when you're driving, okay? Presto, I realized over the last week that when I'm scanning, I sometimes have trouble moving my eyes fast enough and looking everywhere at once, especially when backing up. So, presto, uh, the video that I want you to look at, Corey will put this up for you, uh, go into the C playlist, seeing an observation. The first video, where to look, and I talk about that. When you're observing, you actually need to move your head, okay? You need to move your head. You cannot <laughs> look around and do all the observation that you need to do simply by moving your eyes, because your eyes don't move enough in your skull. You're biologically limited there. So you need to move your head. You need to be looking, and you need to look quickly, okay? Because you're relying a lot on your peripheral vision to be able to see well, so know that uh, when you're observing. Okay, AJ, on the street I can talk, but on the highway I need to be silent, and my music can't be so loud. And yes, and you'll get better at that, AJ, that sound will not be so distracting. You'll be able to play the music in the car and whatnot, but right now it's going to be distracting because it's just the way cognitively we work. It's the way our brain works, that our brain is focusing on what we're doing and there's a lot of things going on with cars. And this is another piece that I wanna talk about, especially for new drivers who are learning how to drive. And this is for uh, new drivers learning to drive cars, bus drivers, truck drivers, motorcycles, any one of those things, okay? When we learn in public education, we only learn one of the intelligences, maybe two, okay? And there are four of them. There's physical intelligence, academic intelligence, spiritual intelligence, and emotional intelligence. And when you're learning to drive, you have all four of those intelligence, okay? So academic intelligence, so in other words, brain smart, book smart, looking at books, reading manuals, understanding terminology, understanding all the rules of the roadway and whatnot. So you have book smart, and this is the one you get in public education. You have emotional intelligence, which not so much in public education, unless you're dealing with bullies and other people that you don't really like and whatnot, but emotional intelligence is you're, ba you're able to keep calm under fire, so to speak. So if somebody says something to you and you don't like what they say and you, you're trying to control your temper, that's emotional intelligence. Then we have physical intelligence as well, our ability, kinesthetic memory within our body and people who study martial arts and people who study music and those types of things, they know about physical intelligence, their ability to, for their body to be able to play an instrument or to sing on key and whatnot. 
Martial arts, the same thing. Your ability for your body to learn information. And we need physical intelligence when we're driving a car. How far do we turn the steering wheel? How much do we push down on the brake pedal, the throttle, and whatnot? And then finally, spiritual intelligence. Our ability to complete the mission. <laughs> because when you're out driving a car and somebody cuts you off and you get you lose your temper, you can't just park the car on the side of the road and, and decide to go home. <laughs> you can't do that. You've got to finish the mission. You've got to finish the trip. So you have spiritual intelligence, right? Your ability to complete the mission, your ability to complete the drive, to go to where you need to go without losing your cool and parking the car on the side of the road and abandoning it there. <laughs> so this is the, one of the reasons why I think for a lot of new people learning to drive a car, a truck, a bus, or a motorcycle, or learning air brakes, that it's incredibly challenging for a lot of people because we don't live in a world anymore where a lot of people grow up on farms and drive lawn tractors and drive farm equipment and whatnot and come to the task of driving with some background and experience like I did. I mean, by the time I came to the task of driving, uh, I'd already been driving for five years on the farm, driving tractors and bulldozers and old pickup trucks and those sorts of things. We don't have that experience anymore. People come to driving and never been in behind the wheel before. They never went camping with their people, their parents and drove on the back, on a back road and whatnot. And then they find it incredibly challenging, but they're watching other people and they're thinking, well, that looks really easy. <laughs> well, it's incredibly easy for Bruce Lee to do martial arts as well when he was alive. It's also very easy for Tiger Woods to play golf and compete at an international level because these people have been doing it for years and years and years and years and it looks incredibly easy. But if I was to go up and play golf, Oh, it would look really bad. No, oh, it would actually be humorous about how bad I would be at golf because it's incredibly physical and emotional. It's an emotional intelligence as well. You got to keep your cool, right? There's a little bit of book smart that goes with it, but there's, you know, complete the mission. You got to complete nine holes, 18 holes, for many holes there are in the game of golf, right? So there's a lot of things going on. So if you're having difficulty learning how to drive a car, a truck, a bus, learning how to do air brakes, give Give, breathe and give yourself some room in which to learn because personally for me right now I mean many of you know that I'm training jujitsu well I trained karate for years I got a black belt in karate but jujitsu is completely different jujitsu is ground fighting it's advanced wrestling but to do a triangle <laughs> a triangle choke <laughs> Ah, that's funny maybe in two years but it's pretty tough for me all right so back to answering some questions I have my little rant there priceless I actually always roll my window down a tiny bit just because like hearing the road and the traffic when driving yes excellent and the other thing about that priceless is you can also hear the machine and again this is important for motorcycle riders cyclists bus drivers truck drivers you need to hear the machine. You need to hear the other traffic and know the importance of hearing the other traffic. You can hear when it's approaching. If you're in a quiet country road and you're at a cross street, you can hear cars coming, especially if you're on a bicycle and you're outdoors. You can hear the traffic approaching. And we had a comment uh, last week about uh, electric vehicles. Yes, they're quiet, but they still create road noise because the tires on the pavement on the road surface create road noise. So yes, sound is very important when driving. Presto, uh, apparently my driving school said when I take the test with them, I can't wear sunglasses during the test. Yes, Presto, they said that. I disagree. I disagree. And if you need to wear sunglasses, because you can't see, because I know I can't see. When it's sunny out, I have three pairs of car, three pairs of sunglasses in my car. Because if I lose a pair of sunglasses and it's sunny out and I'm driving, it really, really hurts my eyes. I struggle to see. And if they say you can't wear sunglasses, you simply say to them, well, I'm sorry, but this is a safety issue because I, I'm, I'm straining to see in the bright sunshine. So you should be wearing sunglasses if you need to wear sunglasses, okay? Uh, presto, I guess you wouldn't and shouldn't like driving a Rolls Royce because you would be, wouldn't be able to hear anything because the insulation is very strong. Yes, presto, but if I'm driving in a Rolls Royce, if I have a Rolls Royce, somebody else is going to be driving the car. <laughs> I'm not going to drive my Rolls Royce. No, I'm going to get somebody else to drive it. I'm going to sit in the back. <laughs> Good point, though. 
Uh, Cody, driving isn't a privilege, it's a responsibility. Yes, it's definitely a responsibility, for sure. Uh, Jonathan, I would say driving is both a privilege and a responsibility. Some claim it's a right, but it's not. You are a danger to the road and yourself. It fails, falls on your responsibility. Absolutely, yes. Carrie, uh, when merging, when the on-ramp has a sharp curve with a short acceleration lane, I know one has to go slow around the curve. Uh, when is the earliest one can speed up to reach highway speeds as quickly as possible? Uh, as soon as you start to straighten out, uh, Carrie, the other thing you need to understand that when you're coming around the curve, if you're starting to accelerate, the car is going to hold the curve better, first of all. And Corey will put the video up for you on uh, curvy roads, how to drive on curvy roads. And one of the things you want to do is to uh, it power through the curve. And as you start coming around the end of the curve, so I would say the last half of the curve, you want to start accelerating. If the car breaks loose, Carrie, just simply let your foot off the throttle again and then punch the throttle back down. Most of us in this day and age are driving either all wheel drive vehicles or we're driving front wheel drive vehicles. It's unlikely that you're gonna be driving a rear wheel drive vehicle, unless you're driving a pickup truck, of course, or some other vehicle. But for the most of us, they're gonna be driving a front wheel drive vehicle or all wheel drive. If you're coming around there and you're starting to accelerate and it, you feel it kind of break loose a little bit or it starts to go sideways, just let your foot off the throttle, punch the throttle back down, and then just hammer that, hammer that puppy. <laughs> Get her going. Pedal to the mat, pedal to the metal, mashing on that gas. Get her going, okay? But as you're lining up to mash on the gas to get up to highway speed, make sure you're looking out on the roadway. You're picking your spot. Aim for your spot because remember, the onus of responsibility for merging is on the merging driver. The other drivers don't have to move out on the roadway. They, most of the time they will if you communicate effectively. But pick your spot, aim for your spot, okay? Uh, da -da -da, Bryant, am I a truck driver trainer? Yes, I am, Bryant. Uh, if you got any questions, I can help you with those. Teach air brakes as well and bus. So yes, we got it all going on here. And more than happy to help. Uh, priceless, nothing worse than the sun being super bright while the road is wet. And yes, that can make it challenging. It's similar to driving at night in the rain and in an urban area and you get the urban lights reflecting off the roadway. It can be very distracting and very difficult to see the roadway. So, okay. All right. Jason, quick question. Speed limits in residential area construction zones. Thank you. Okay, so Jason for... Uh, Speed limits, excellent question. Inside the city, speed limit is 50 kilometers an hour, 30 miles an hour, unless otherwise posted. Outside of urban areas, on highways and whatnot, speed limit is 50, or 50 miles an hour, 80 kilometers an hour, unless otherwise posted. In construction zones, yes, if it's in a city, you can drive less than 30 miles an hour or 50 kilometers an hour, but pay attention to any temporary condition signs that will indicate that the speed limit is lower in a construction zone and they will be regulatory signs. If they have reduced the speed limit in the construction zone, they will be speed signs, excuse me, they will be rectangle, white background, black lettering, and that is a regulatory sign. The root word of regulatory is regulation, which means it's the law and you need to obey that, so know that, okay? All right, bricks for wheels. Corey got the video up on driving on curvy roads. Thank you for that. Rush Girl, great tip. I was wondering about that too. Excellent. Presto. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Rush Girl. That's awesome. <laughs> Super Chat. And yes, Super Chat is available. And just a show of hands, metaphorically speaking, of course, because I can't see your hands. Uh, how many people would be interested in having some, some information, question and answers that would be available on Patreon? I'm pretty sure that most people are aware of what Patreon is. I'm seriously thinking of getting a Patreon account going in conjunction with my YouTube channel so you'll be available for that sort of thing. So, introvert, hello and good evening. Cody, my dad's got distracted from a nice Audi dealership and almost drove into the curb on the highway. Uh, sports cars are a hazard. Yes, there are a number of things along the highway that can be distracting. And I would be on board with your dad. Uh, my dream car is a Maserati. And if I saw a Maserati parked on the side of the road, I'd probably be distracted too. So, <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Rush Girl. That's, that's awesome. 
Jonathan, uh, whatever the posted speed in the construction zone and residential area, that's the posted. You must abide by it. Uh, you don't want work zone violations on your record. Absolutely, especially in the states because a lot of them are double the fine for construction zones. I know I've been pulled over in construction zones and I'll tell you the story. <laughs> Back driving truck, I was doing a run between Cambridge, Ontario and Dalton, Georgia. And Dalton, Georgia is just over the state line from Tennessee, about 30 miles into Georgia. And uh, you come down from Ontario, you go through Michigan. It's about 45 miles from Michigan into Ohio. And from Toledo, Ohio to uh, Cincinnati, Ohio is 213 miles. And that 213 miles must be done at 55 miles an hour because Ohio, the state of Ohio, has dual speed chip, speed limits, rather. Dual speed limits. One for cars, 70 miles an hour. One for trucks, 55 miles an hour. Well, when the cars are doing 70 and you're in your big truck doing 55, it's very boring. And then you come down to the river in Cincinnati, you cross the river into Kentucky, and you get into Kentucky and the speed limit goes from 55 miles an hour to 65 miles an hour. And when you cross the river there in Cincinnati in the big truck, you're like, woohoo! <laughs> We're going now, you know? Pedal to the metal, mashing on the gas, that sort of thing, because you just spent four and a half, five hours in Ohio doing 55 miles an hour. Now you can do 65. So come down across the river, up the hill, and in Kentucky, and I'm listening to an audio book. And of course, I'm probably a bit tired by this time because I've been driving for six or seven hours. And didn't notice that I was in a construction zone with reduced speed limits. And yes, I got pulled over. Yes. So, and it was double the fine. I think it was $250 American which is a lot of money Canadian, it, like $1,000 or something goofy. <laughs> yes, so know that. Uh, <laughs> Jonathan, this is why I hate sports cars. They're noisy, they're expensive, maintenance is expensive. I used to like them until I earned the cost of owning one. <laughs> well, they're not all ex uh, noisy, Jonathan. Some of them are actually quite quiet. Uh, yeah, some of the big muscle cars are definitely noisy. Uh, and they're, yeah, they're expensive. They can be. <laughs> uh, Cody, could I get a link for the smart driver's map who passed their road test? Yes, you can. Uh, where is the link? Uh, what I'll do, Cody, uh, send me an email and I'll find it for you. Rick at smartdrivetest.com and I'll send you, I'll send you that link for sure. Introvert, uh, like what happened last year in Florida, the black guy didn't have to die because of that stupid parking disabled thing. The guy was shot to death of nonsense, turned the other cheek. Yes, yes, there is an excellent point. Uh, <laughs> Cody, Rick's been pulled over. Yeah, I've been pulled over a fair bit, Cody, especially when I was driving truck. Yes, I have been pulled over. <laughs> and I have been given tickets. Uh What's considered a sports car? Well, you know, it, it depends on who you are and who you ask, Hall Phase, about what a sports car is. My brother has a 1977 rebuilt Trans Am with a 455 four barrel dual exhaust. Uh, yes, that would be, he would consider that a sports car. Me, on the other hand, you know, Audi, BMW, Maserati, Ferrari, you know, those are sports cars. But don't tell my brother that. Okay, Presto, uh, Teslas are quiet, super quick cars. Yes, they are, Presto. And uh, if you read anything about selling Teslas, one of the things that they get test drivers to do is to launch them. These, I mean, they're crazy fast. They, something like zero to 60 miles an hour in 2.8 seconds or something crazy like that. Somebody, one of the smart drivers will know the exact number. But it's, it's crazy. And I mean, one of the things that... Uh, uh, Elon Musk was doing at the beginning of when he was first marketing electric cars and whatnot. He would go out, uh, take his friends out in the car on a back road or whatnot. He would put a hundred dollar bill on the dashboard and then he would say to them, okay, when I tell you, I want you to get the hundred dollar bill off the dashboard and he would launch the electric motor and it would sit them right back in the seat. And literally the G forces would prevent them from getting the money off the dash. That's how, that's how quick they are, how much they accelerate. All right, Presto, uh, we'll probably be going on the freeway for the first time within the next couple of weeks. Any tips or things that I should be aware of? Yes. So Presto, uh, watch the videos on merging. That'll help you out, first of all. And then second of all, know that because vehicles are traveling at higher speeds, the spaces between the vehicles are going to be bigger, right? Because <coughs> it's, it's simple math, the way that we figure out. And this is why we measure 
following distance in time uh, because the faster you go it's relative right so you're traveling at a higher feet per second when you're at higher speeds so therefore when you increase your speed out to three seconds so say just for sake of argument so at 30 miles an hour you're traveling at 50 feet per second at 60 miles you're traveling at 60 feet per second because it's twice the, twice the speed so if you're traveling at a three second following distance at 60 you are at 180 feet whereas at 30 miles an hour you would only be at 90 feet okay so see this is the reason so it's going to be bigger spaces manage the space around your vehicle well when you're out on the roadway and if you're doing the speed limit which you will because you're learning how to drive stay in the right hand lane and as well before you go out on the highway the freeway mile markers know where you're going know which exit you're going to get on or off when you're on the highway state roads will also have them there in texas and uh interstates will have the mile markers know exactly which one you're going to get off at because it's it's a form of defensive driving so if you get on the interstate say at mile marker 670 just for sake of argument you get on at 670 and you know you're going to get off at 600 so you're going to drive 70 miles along the freeway uh, you get on at 670 you're gonna get off at 600 that way when you start getting around uh, so the numbers are going down so once you get around the 605 you know that you need to get over to the right you know that you're gonna five miles down the road you're gonna get off the roadway so it's going to help you immensely uh, to travel safely on interstates and state roads and whatnot so do that as well okay uh, we'll probably there we go presto model 0 to 60 in 2.5 seconds there you go uh, Presto was my Google jockey looked up the exact information for Tesla and uh, yes that's called the launch mode on the Tesla it does that crazy amount of speed uh, 0 to 60 miles an hour in 2.5 seconds I mean that is absolutely unheard of I mean that is just something else that is sitting you back in your seat and it's good fun too uh, Amara First off, thank you so much for all your great advice. I'm preparing to take my driver's test this week. I still have difficulty understanding what pedals to press during left turns. Advice, yes. The only pedal that you should be pressing is the brake and the throttle, okay? Uh, and if you're still having a little bit of trouble with that, Amara, I might suggest that before you go down for your road test, go down to the parking lot and just get some pylons and practice in the pylon working back and forth between the throttle and the brake just so you don't mix those up so you have a really good understanding that the one on the right is the throttle and makes the car go and the one on the left makes the car stop the brake all right so know that and i would suggest and corey will put that video up for you on how to learn to drive and that'll help you out there okay uh but um and as well if you haven't seen the video already amara have the look at the how to turn left at complex intersections. That'll help you out as well uh, in terms of preparing for your test this week. And if, if you have any questions at all, drop us a comment. I try and get to them every day or so and get back to you and it can help you out. And you can also drop me an email if you need some help, uh, rick at smartdrivetest.com and um, I'll answer any questions you have. Blessed, my friend. Hi, Rick. I still watch your videos and live streams. I hope you're doing well. I am doing exceptionally well, blessed. And thank you so much for dropping in. Blessed is there in Hawaii on the great island there. So it's awesome. Hall phase, love to try out a Tesla. And you can for sure. Uh, I'm not sure how their longevity is going to work in terms of cold climates and those types of things. But for the most part, I think they're going to do well. Jonathan, uh, abide all traffic conditions and speeds. Uh, don't be nervous because uh, you're dealing with faster speeds than residential speeds. Keep practicing and you'll get better. Yes. And, you know, you're definitely going to get better. And the other thing, just on that note of what Jonathan was saying, make sure you look farther down the roadway, right? So you can figure out what other traffic is doing and try to drive in the spaces between the clusters because you'll notice when you get out on the highway that cars drive in groups for whatever reason. <laughs> so there'll be a group here. You want to drive here and there'll be another group behind you. You want to try to drive in the spaces between the clusters, okay? Amara, you're most welcome. Presto, how would a Hyundai Genesis sedan be for a first car? Uh, I think it'd be fine. It's you got to know that a Hyundai Genesis is a sports car, so uh, there is that to consider as well. I would definitely look up 
some of the reviews on the internet here and see how that goes and see what kind of information you get about a Hyundai Genesis but I haven't heard anything bad about them and I'll just leave that out there to the other smart drivers as well uh, you know what's going on with the Hyundai Genesis has anybody had one or had any experience with it and what what was your experience was it good or bad and just leave a comment down in the comment section there and that'll help out uh, Presto there if he's looking at a Hyundai Genesis for a first vehicle okay uh, Max hello and thanks for the nighttime driving while raining there has been a lot of rain here lately especially at night but thankfully I haven't need to go out excellent that's great Max that we could help you out with the raining and I'm gonna have to head down to the coast here sometime soon to check out my rental property and I'll get you some more information about driving in the rain and driving at night uh, Michael hey Rick from San Antonio excellent another one from Texas thanks for all you do now that I have my license I just need to get a car oh I'm feeling like uh, <laughs> that'll take forever yeah it's not gonna take forever Michael but you will get a car and it's gonna be awesome because there is nothing like your first car first car is brilliant so whoever has a car leave just leave a comment here uh, what was your first car my first car was a 1971 GMC half ton with three in the tree and a straight six cylinder under the hood with a top top speed of 80 miles an hour it was gold two-tone gold and black <laughs> that was my first vehicle uh, I had a couple of motorcycles before that too but that was my first real vehicle and in the winter time the defrost didn't work you had to sit in it with an ice scraper and a snowsuit so you didn't freeze to death <laughs> there you go uh, colored wolves in the US can you flash emergency lights to say thank you to other drivers uh, yes when you're out on the road colored uh, wolves you certainly can there's nothing preventing you from doing that uh, just flash your four ways three times to say thank you uh, that's generally the kind of accepted language for thank you so there's nothing that prevents you from doing that priceless 1990 Honda Accord excellent first vehicle Honda's I'm a little uh, I'm biased towards Honda's for sure uh, I have a 1998 Honda CRV it's my second of that vintage and the vehicle is now approaching just about 335,000 kilometers got to get a little bit of bo body work done on it but other than that works well okay Amara hi Rick can you review the questions that instructors ask when they first enter your car during the driver's test yes okay so what's gonna happen Amara uh, have a look at the pre-trip inspection video Corey will look at that if you're taking your personal vehicle down you definitely want to do a pre-trip inspection and make sure everything's working uh, seat belts are working on the passenger side make sure all the lights are working uh, because you don't want to get down there and have a brake light out because it's really easy to change a brake light on most vehicles right it'll only take 10 or 15 minutes so make sure everything's working have a look at that uh, so the examiner will come out and if there's any signs on the test center uh, there's some test centers that won't let you back into the space those aren't those are more you know the exception than they are the norm uh, but you want to back into the stall where you're going to start your road test because you don't want to back out the first time you want to drive out and then kind of get comfortable because the first five minutes is going to be the most daunting after that you're going to be okay back into the stall you'll go in you'll check in inside the test center you'll need your license you'll need another piece of identification you'll need some money with you uh, so you go in you check in after you go in and check in go to the toilet <laughs> go and check go to the toilet because it's really hard to finish your road test if you got your legs crossed because you've got to pee or something like that so <laughs> go to the toilet and then go out take a couple of minutes breathe the examiner will come out they'll do the pre-trip inspection they'll get in they'll give you a little spiel probably a couple of minutes they'll say listen we're, we're not gonna I'm not gonna give you any surprises I'm not gonna ask you to do anything illegal I'm not gonna ask you to do anything unsafe okay so that's what they'll tell you to do they'll give you lots of notice right some examiners may say at the next at the controlled intersection turn right they want you to figure out what it is so it's a controlled intersection it's a stop sign a yield sign or traffic lights okay most won't say that but some will if they say at the uncontrolled intersection so if you're driving along a major road and they say turn at the turn right at the next uncontrolled intersection they want you to turn at the next road where there isn't any or there aren't any controls okay so that's basically it you know do your thing okay focus on what you're doing they'll give you lots of notice they'll say in two blocks turn right at the controlled intersection they're not gonna surprise you they're not gonna say at the last minute oh turn right here they're not gonna say that okay they'll give you lots of notice they're really good at it unless they're brand new and they don't have a lot of experience doing what they're doing but for the most part examiners are really good they know you're nervous okay 
They'll give you lots of room. Focus on what you're doing and just do what they ask you to do. If you make a mistake during the test, just take a breath because the examiner may not have even seen it and then carry on with what you need to do, okay? All right, okay, Jaden, hey Rick, uh, when me and my therapist were practicing for my driver's license, we almost got into a crash, so we thought a white car was pulling out, so I slammed on the brakes, but luckily no one was hurt. Excellent, always good when it's a near miss. <laughs> uh, Michael, yes, for sure, priceless. I'm about three kilometers from the 300,000 K. Excellent, another great Honda. Uh, Michael, my first car, uh, Hyundai Getz, 2006 model, diesel turbocharged, loved it. I've heard really good things about diesels, so that's really awesome. Uh, Presto, any tips for forward perpendicular par parking? I'm currently struggling with that. Yes, what I would suggest, Presto, is that instead of trying to work in a parking lot and doing the forward uh, parking, go down to the parking lot and work with some pylons. Go and rent some of those 36-inch, one-meter-tall pylons. And then that way you can figure out where your vehicle is in space and place. And if you hit the pylon, it's not a big deal. If you hit another car, woo, you know, <laughs> that's a big deal because people get excited, especially if it's like one of them fancy sports cars I was talking about, you know, Audis and BMWs and whatnot. So do that, get comfortable with that, and, you know, start with the pylons being fairly wide apart. And then as you get better and better, bring the, the pylons in tighter and tighter. As well, the other thing that's going to help you with that, Presto, is go out and practice some of your reversing. Oddly enough, driving backwards will improve your forward driving and will improve your ability to determine where your vehicle is in space and place because that's what you're having trouble with in terms of parking, right? Where's my vehicle in space and place? Where is it in relation to other parked vehicles and fixed objects? So go down and do a little bit of work in the parking lot. And Corey will put the video up for you on how to learn to drive and that'll help you out. Okay, haul phase, how hard is it to ride a moped? Uh, probably it's a little step up between riding a bicycle and riding a motorcycle. You know, it's not too hard to do because you got some pedals on the older mopeds. I don't know about the new ones, but you got some pedals and then you get the thing going and you know, it's not too hard. So, <coughs> excuse me. Jas Raj, uh, if I'm approaching an intersection, I see the pedestrian countdown three, two, one, and at one I am like ten meters or less from the stop line. Do I start breaking on the green? Am I making sense? Yes. Now, Jas Raj, one of the things that you're going to have to determine is I know what you're asking me: stopping at yellow lights at intersections, and this is something that is going to take a bit of driving practice because it's not something that comes naturally. And I know this from experience of teaching people how to drive, especially larger vehicles buses and, and trucks and those types of tractor trailers and whatnot. No vehicle will stop in its own length. And some lights, when you have the pedestrian countdown, it gets down to zero, the light automatically turns yellow. Some lights that's gonna happen, at other lights it's not going to happen. There's going to be a delay before the light turns yellow. So you're gonna have to understand the traffic lights, the controlled intersections in and around the test center where you're gonna be taking your test, okay? So that's why I say to students, practice in and around the test center where you're going to be taking your test because then you'll know uh, that traffic light. And if you're unsure and it is in that catchment in the area around the test center where you're going to be taking your test, you want to know whether that light's actually going to change when it gets to zero. Is it automatically going to go to yellow? You, want, you need to know that information, right? And you only do that by driving in and around the test center and practicing at those lights because if, if there's a delay then you don't want to slow down. You just want to proceed through. You want to cover the brake, scan the intersection well, and then proceed through the intersection. So it's going to depend. Okay, so you're going to have to do a little bit of practice with that. Okay, Presto, uh, have you ever driven a Jeep Wrangler? If so, what are they like to drive on the road? I have not driven a Jeep Wrangler, Presto, but I will put that out to the other smart drivers. I'm sure there are a lot of people uh, who have driven a Jeep Wrangler. And uh, just my personal opinion, I was talking to this today with a friend of mine in the car, actually, we were talking about a, we were, earlier we were talking about Hyundais. We are talking about the Hyundai Tiburon. The, the Hyundai Tiburon is a girl car. <laughs> I, I'm gonna sound sexist here, but it's like a Miata. You can't really drive it as a man. I don't know why. But, uh, you know, the Jeep, Jeep is in fear, I think, of becoming a girl car. It's not something that men can drive. I know there's going to be a lot of people who are going to disagree with me. <laughs> and this may, 
<laughs> I may have just gotten myself into trouble here. So I'm just going to slightly, I'm just going to gently tiptoe away from that, that subject very quickly. Hall phase, good night. Thank you so much. All the best, my friend there in Toronto. Uh, Fida, it's hard to understand signs through study. Is there any technique to identify them? Yes, Fida. Uh, walk along the roadway. Next time you're in a car, look at the road signs going along the roadway. Jot them down. What the meaning is and those types of things, have a look at those. As well, go over to the Smart Drive Test website. On Down on the right side on the menu there, you'll find a road test test. Okay, it'll help you practice road tests. And uh, <laughs> so, Cody, too funny. Sorry, I was distracted there. So do the practice test for road signs. That'll help you out as well. Corey, I'll put the video up for you on uh, uh, da -da 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 -da. road sign classifications. There's a whole playlist here on road signs and road sign classifications. Know the different classifications. If you know the classifications of road signs, regulatory signs, cautionary signs, construction signs, destination signs. If you know the different classifications of signs, that will help you out, okay? Uh, to understand road signs, okay? So know that. <clears throat> Cody, I agree with you on the Jeep car comment. I'll defend you in court. Excellent, thank you so much, Cody. And as well, Cody, no, it's, I like Hondas and I like Toyotas too. If I was recommending to new drivers what vehicle to purchase, I would say either a Honda or a Toyota. I would recommend either one of those vehicles. Uh, definitely, I would I would probably dissuade you from buying a Honda Ridgeline. I, I don't know. That was just kind of one that, that Honda didn't get right. You know, it's kind of like the giraffe. Didn't, didn't quite get that right. Okay? So know that. Uh, if you want a truck, definitely a Toyota truck. Okay? So, <laughs> okay, so I'm running up on the hour here. I got kind of all excited here today. I was having a good good go here. Uh, Carrie, thanks for all the good information and for answering all our questions. You are most welcome. Rush Girl loves Jeeps. Uh, excellent. More and more girls are driving Wranglers. Yes, and uh, when I was at university in the 1990s at the University of Western Ontario, it's now called Western University. I don't know why they changed the name of my university. Uh, the hoity-toities used to drive Jeeps, <laughs> which was pretty funny. Now, usually all the kids from Toronto who said they left home and drove two and a half hours down the road and went to Western. So there you go. Jennifer, I passed first time after watching your videos and practicing what you taught in the videos. It gave me so much confidence. Thank you. And thank you, Jennifer, for letting us know. Congratulations on passing. Where did you go on your first uh, solo trip there? Uh, getting your license. I bet you that's simply awesome. All the best. All right. Uh, <laughs> Resubscribe. He likes Tonus. Awesome. Okay. Uh, what are some good starter cars for beginning? Uh, okay. Toyota Corollas, uh, the Tacoma, the, it's a small Toyota truck, Honda Civic, uh, the CRVs, any one of those. Uh, I'm not being paid by Honda, I'm not being paid to, by a Toyota. Maybe I could, that would make my job a little bit easier, but good, reliable cars. If you're going to pick a car, uh, okay, then simply look at the reviews on the internet. There's tons and tons and tons of reviews on here about the cars and the things that could particularly go wrong with them. Uh, any car is going to serve you well for your first vehicle. Just get a car, go on the road, and have a blast driving around because there's nothing better. All right, Epic, uh, good luck for taking the, the test. Is practicing on a larger vehicle? Should I go for an SUV or a crossover because they have a different driver view than a regular sedan? Definitely, uh, but taking the test, Epic, I would definitely encourage you to use a mid-size car, okay? Definitely use a mid-size car. Katie, thank you for helping me study better for the learner's permit. You're most welcome. Uh, according to my therapist, I start driving at the beginning of December or the end of December, I'll be able to get my license. That's brilliant. So, Jaden, definitely do that. Get your license. We're here for you. Anything you need, let us know. Uh, Jonathan, good luck. Everyone who is taking their road test, and remember, don't get upset if you fail. You can take it again and practice more. And exactly that. You didn't fail. It's an unsuccessful attempt, and you'll get it on the next go. All right, so thank you everybody. Congratulations to all those smart drivers who passed in the last week or so. Uh, leave us a comment, hit that thumbs up button, and check out the courses over at smartdrivetest.com. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great day. Bye now.